Okay. Uh, Hi, Roberto. So. I think uh, I'm uh, back. So nice to see you, Kathy. Thank you again, also you for joining this beautiful workshop. So I've seen that the people are very and been very good, and uh, very loyal to to the program. Even though unfortunately everything has been done online. So I think we have still one minute. Hi, Claudio. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I saw your presentation actually. Uh, yes. uh, your introduction. You told me that I couldn't join even if I was going to the pub until three o'clock. Unfortunately, here in uh, Montreal we have the curfew at eight o'clock, so okay. <laughs> and everything okay. is closed. I think it's worse than in Italy, or maybe the same as in Italy now. I'm more or like less the same, yes. Yeah, and we were discussing before with Sergey and Stefan. Unfortunately, the situation is a bit gloomy. Hopefully, with this vaccination, things are going to change. Yeah. Anyway. I think uh, it's uh, sort of time to start. And I'm very pleased to present the next speaker, Kathy uh, Luch from TU Berlin in Germany. And the title of the talk is Reservoir Computing with Laser Networks, Performance, Memory Capacity, and M Optimization via Eigenvalue Analysis. Eigenvalue Analysis. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I will start sharing my screen, right? That works. Okay, so can you see the slide and? Yes, I can see them and now we can see the full screen. Okay, that is good. So then um, I will start. So as you said, I will talk about reservoir computing, which is a part of machine learning uh, that we already heard about on Tuesday from Miguel Soriano. And um, I will, um, talk about it from the theoretical side. I'm from the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the Technische University of Berlin. And um, we heard the talk this morning from Juri Genti. So I, I just put this figure here um, where you can see all these different um, aspects of machine learning, just to put you in order where we are going to talk about or where I'm going to talk about uh, now. And this will be um, reservoir computing and then we will talk about this prediction of nonlinear dynamics. So it's a small part of all these uh, different concepts that we already talked about, but um, we will learn today about how uh, this performance of these reservoir computers can be understood by looking at the nonlinear dynamic properties of these devices. And uh, the outline um, of my talk, you can see here. So first I will do a short motivation. I think a lot has already been said about this technique, but um, still to, um, motivate you why we should look at yet another technique for machine learning. And then um, I want to concentrate on time scales um, of the system. So the time scale that we inject the data in and the, the time scales of the dynamics of the system. And uh, I want to talk about different network topologies um, to get a bit of a, a picture how to um, understand and optimize those kind of systems. Uh, then uh, next point will be laser networks, where the picture that you see here, which is just one laser with a, a delay will be extended to larger networks. And the last point will be the deep reservoir computing, if we have time, um, where uh, the concept of this deep learning is combined um, with the reservoir computing. Um, all that was funded by the German Research Foundation, by the Collaborative Research Center 910. And of course, I have to thank my group. Um, as you see, it's Corona, so we all have the mask, but we can take them off. And um, you can see here Felix Köster, who is a PhD student and who is working also on these reservoir computing topics. So you will see parts of his results too. And then we have Christoph Dehn, who did a bachelor thesis, and Lukas Rösel. So they all contributed to the work I'm presenting today. And um, to start, with the motivation, um, 
you already heard about why we want to use machine learning at all. I mean, here on the left side, um, we see the normal structure of a phenomenon architecture for a normal computer with a CPU. So you have to somehow program what you want to solve. So you have to sit down and you have to think, and then you have to understand and tell the um, machine what to do. And it's completely different with this neural networks with the machine learning, because there everything you need is a lot of data. A lot of people showed these cats and dots. So I put them here too. So you need a lot of labeled data. These can be pictures, this can be spectra, this can be pulse shapes. We heard a lot about that uh, during this workshop. And if you have these data, then what you do with the neural network is you just train your system to find a good mapping between the input and the output signal. And this is then uh, your computer, your computation. So. Um, it's a completely different approach than the normal computer. But um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, not related to these neural networks where you uh, design your networks by changing the weights and uh, adjusting the weights to make it a good uh, mapping between the input and output signal. Instead, we use this reservoir computing setup where you have a delay-based architecture. So you have a laser and then you have a mirror next to it. and the light goes around in this external cavity and you use the internal dynamics of the laser um, as your network. And then you just put data in and you measure the intensity that comes out. And this is what um, I'm going to talk about today, which um, is supposed to have the advantage of much less power consumption because if we look at the usual implementations of these uh, networks that can do machine learning or here by mind these um, computers that can play AlphaGo, um, here is the um, publication where they wrote how many CPUs and GPUs they had to use to train the system to actually um, win against the biological version uh, of the computer, this guy is sitting here, and they consumed one megawatt while the human brain only consumed 20 watts. So this is the motivation why, why these um, machine learning approaches with a biological architecture uh, being looked at. And now with these optical systems, the idea is that we can become even faster. Um, so if you think about your brain, you have time scales of microseconds because the signals have to propagate. You heard about that this morning. So with optics, we are at nanosecond time scales. So there's of course a huge advantage here to speed the thing up. You can easily fabri fabricate that on a chip and the data injection and the data readout is also easy because you can use the intensity of the light um, that you can easily detect. But of course, since there's no free lunch, using these optical systems, you have the problem that the systems itself perform some non-equilibrium dynamics because these are driven systems. If you have active lasers, for instance, so what we will see today is that the dynamics of the system itself also plays a role in understanding um, how the performance um, can be optimized since such an optical system is not like a neuron that you can model by an uh, tangent hyperbolicus function, some nonlinearity, but it has a time dependence to it, um, which is also the big advantage um, when you think of choosing tasks that have a time dependence. So if you have some time series and you want to predict the next step, then you need to have some system that has a time dependence, that has some memory, and that can also remember some um, points in the past. When you speak a sentence, then it's not also important what the last word was, but also the, some other words before might be um, important to know um, what has been said. So that's the motivation for these uh, reservoir delay-based architectures. And we need only four steps in realizing these systems. 
we need to input the data, of course. And then what we use here as our reservoir can be basically everything if we think of reservoir computing. Um, so it can be the laser as I will use it with the delay. It can also be a bucket of water. It can be a passive optical cavity. So whatever has a rich dynamics and a high um, output dimension um, can be used here. Then we record whatever we want to detect, a bucket, bucket of water, it would be the height of the water at different positions. For the laser, it will be the intensity at different points in time. And what we then need to do to train the system is just the optimization via matrix inversion. That's the huge advantage. As I said in the beginning, we don't need to train this reservoir. We use it as it is. And the optimization is only done at the output weights. So we just change the weighting of the different outputs that we read out here. And then uh, we have a classifier and output and we can use it as a mapping as is used for these neural networks between the input and the output data. So in a nutshell, reservoir computing is basically a network where you that you don't train and you only train the final layer. And it has the advantage that you can use whatever system you have, whatever reservoir um, you can nicely handle. And by handling, I mean putting in the data and reading it out. Um, it is usually nicely suited for time-dependent problems. And the disadvantage, of course, is that since you don't train the network, you have to hope that it can perform the map mapping that you want. So in order to make it perform good, you have to have a high uh, dimensional system, high dimensional in phase space and high dimensional dynamics. Okay, so we will start with this laser and the delay section as our reservoir um, that we want to look at in more um, detail. But before I start to do that, I want to do a short detour about dynamics because I told you that the dynamic of the system itself will be important to understand uh, the performance. So before we start with the training of our system, we have to understand what the system is doing without input. So if we just uh, have a laser and a mirror behind and we model that by a rate equation system here written for the electric field E. Um, it is a laser, so we have the nonlinear interaction between the inversion of the active medium and the field here. So that is the stimulated emission term. And then we have the feedback term um, from the mirror. The important thing here is the argument. It's T minus tau. So the intensity at time T is changed by the intensity that is, is delayed by the time tau. So we have a feedback system. Uh, this morning, we um, Stefan Ballon talked about this uh, electro-optic um, feedback where there was also a delay, but the light wasn't coming directly back into uh, the laser, but it was a change to electric signal and then the, the signal was injected. So here we have an optical feedback and we want to understand what the laser is doing. And for that, I plotted the time series here on the left, the intensity, which is um, E squared and uh, as a function of time. And if I have a very small feedback string, so even smaller than this 0.11, then the laser is just emitting nice stable light. But if I make the reflectivity large enough, so here it was a value of 0.1, um, then the laser starts oscillating. And if I increase this intensity um, even higher, then I can get this period uh, doubling bifurcation. So we get funny um, periodicity in the amplitudes. It can be also these kind of pulses. And from a dynamic point of view, what we usually do is um, create a bifurcation diagram. So we count the maxima in all these time series for the different parameters. And then um, we plot the bifurcation diagram. So here again, the intensity maxima now plotted as a function of the this mirror reflectivity k. 
And we see here in the beginning, the laser is stable, it has just one maximum. And then we have a bifurcation, the behavior starts and we get this pulsing um, behavior like here in the first um, image. And that shows up in the bifurcation diagram by two maxima. And if we increase K further, then we have this um, dynamics where we have four maxima and where we have these dense plots of points, that is where chaotic dynamics happens. And of course we can uh, investigate that even further, but I don't want to go into the details here, but maybe the most important, the first instability, because that's the point that we need to avoid when we want to use the system for the reservoir computing, because there we need to be sure that a certain input always gives the same output. And if the laser has some periodic dynamics on its own, then we can't be sure about that. So we have to find this so-called Hopf bifurcation where the oscillations start, which is the instability threshold. And then we have to operate the laser before that. Or for laser with uh, this feedback section, what you can see, then you have all these chaotic dynamics, period doubling and homoclinic bifurcations, but then it becomes stable again. So you can also find stable regions for higher um, reflectivity that you have to keep in mind. And something else that's important is the solution structure itself. So what are the solutions of these rate equations? So I put the equations here uh, again, now with the corresponding equation also for the um, carrier density above threshold for the N, which also has a time dependence. It's driven by the pump current P. Then this is the input that we will use uh, later on for our reservoir computing. Um, it has a time scale where it relaxes on and then uh, we have the stimulated emission that kills us, the carriers. And if we want to look for the stable solutions where the laser emits stable light, light what we use, uh, what we need are these um, external cavity modes, the ECMs, as you see here in the title, which are basically rotating wave solutions. And that means rotating wave because we have an electric field that is a complex quantity. It has a real and an imaginary part. But what we want to have is constant intensity. So the electric field can still rotate um, in the complex plane and still have a constant intensity. So an ECM solution um, has constant inversions. So the time dependence of the inversion is not changing anymore, but the intensity uh, can change on this uh, circle in the complex plane. So a solution looks like that here, what we can see in the blue square, we have a constant amplitude and then uh, the oscillation with the frequency large omega. And if we look in this delay system, what kind of solutions we find, then this is not only one, it's plotted here, all the different solutions that we can find the intensity of it over the feedback strength. And what you see at first, we just have this one solution the one we also saw before in the bifurcation diagram, but then uh, new solutions are born and uh, we can have emission at different colors if you want to see it that way. So this is basically the, the frequency of the emitted light. And um, you can also look at it in the space of your external resonator. It's uh, basically a different standing wave inside your resonator that becomes to exist for higher feedback strengths. And um, now I have thin and thick lines here, and that means the stability of the solution. And since that will play a role later on also for the reservoir computing, uh, I want to shortly uh, say what I mean by uh, the stability of uh, our solutions, um, which we can determine by analyzing the eigenvalues and try to write here what our differential equation system, what we have here looks like is basically three dimensional. So we have the real part of E, we have the imaginary part of E and we have the inversion. This changes with time. And this is a function of our three variables, right? So this is 
basically what we have here. So if I talk about eigenvalues um, of the Jacobian, then what I mean is this function f here. Um, no, it's gone. No, this function f, um, which I uh, use to perform the derivative with respect to e, which is one column, then with respect to the imaginary part, and then with respect to um, n. So these are all the vectors, and that gives me the Jacobian um, of my dynamical system, which is a matrix. In our case, a three by three matrix. Um, if I neglect the delay for a second, so all of that is only true if I don't have the delay, but uh, then I have a three by three um, system. I can calculate the eigenvalues. And if these eigenvalues are larger than uh, zero, then my dynamics will be unstable because small perturbations will grow. And if they are smaller than zero, small perturbations will decay. And um, yeah, these are the regions here where the lines are thick. So these are the stable solutions. And the point where they are born is called a settle node bifurcation. So this is what we know about um, our system here with uh, laser with the delay. And um, if we analyze the stability, then the first ECM is what we looked at before in this bifurcation diagram, because that's the solution with the most gain, the maximum gain mode. And uh, this is what will be found experimentally then. And if we have the Hopf bifurcation, we have these periodic oscillations and the chaos afterwards. So now two other parameters that we have to talk about and that can be usually tuned are um, the phase of the injected light. So if you imagine the light traveling around in the cavity, it can accumulate a phase shift. And this is called phi here. And that also changes the dynamics. So we have the um, plane of parameters of the feedback. So the feedback strengths and the phase. And what we can see is the Hopf bifurcation, the one where the oscillations start. Outside the Hopf bifurcation, we have stable emission. Inside, we have this complex dynamics. And along the saddle node bifurcations, these new external cavity modes are born. So if we are here, we still have stable um, emission, but there can be more than one solution for the stable emission because we are behind this point where they are born. So um, again, if we want to do this reservoir computing, we have to find regions where we don't have these uh, complex dynamics. And for people that already work with delay system, uh, just here for the, such a laser, the, the solutions, these external cavity modes, um, if we plot the carrier number, so the in, inversion of our active medium over the frequency, the omega, which is found here um, in our uh, solution. So the color of our um, emitted stable light, then all the possible solutions lie on such an ellipse in phase space. Okay, so we understood what our injection strengths and our phase can do to the dynamics. And now just one word to the tall that we have here. So introducing this delay um, increases um, the number of possible solutions that we can get, increases the dimension of our Jacobian. Um, which becomes basically infinite dimensional when we have a delay tor. And what that means for the dynamics, if you look at the diagram here, we have the number of solutions that we can find, the period of the, oscillation, of the oscillations, the color of our emitted light, this is the omega again, and the amplitude, which is the intensity that is emitted, um, the square root of it. And all of that plotted as a function of the delay time. And what happens if we go to very small delay times, we just have this one solution, which is the dark blue, different phases would shift the solution. These are the other 
blue curves here that look like a shadow, but we just concentrate on the on the blue curve here. And if we increase the delay, then this solution um, shows this bended uh, zigzag structure. And that basically means that our degree of multi-stability increases. So if we go to a, um, uh, to a delay time of 50 times the photon lifetime in that case, then we can count how often we, we cut uh, this bended line, and this is one, two, three, four, five times. So we have um, at least three stable um, solutions in that case. And the more they bend, the more the number of solutions increases. So we have to keep in mind the longer the delay, the larger the multi stability. It doesn't mean that all these solutions are stable, but they exist and they can, um, of course, change the dynamics of the emitted light. For us, for the reservoir computing, this is a good thing that the delay increases this multi-stability because it also increases the richness of the dynamics, the richness of the response of our system. So that can also be exploited. And uh, just one word that uh, this kind of zigzagging bended structure that is called the reappearance of the solutions. You can show that for every delay system um, and that has been shown in this paper here by Sergei Janschuk and co-authors um, that, um, yeah, to explain how this um, curve bends just to um, fulfill the condition of such a delay equation. Okay, so delay increases the multi-stability. And now we start uh, looking at our system for the reservoir computing. So we want to start to do actually some machine learning with it. We have the equation again, the differential equation for the light that comes out. And now we just need to find a task that we want to use to test the system. So it doesn't need to be the task that it's finally used for, but for our simulations, we need some task um, that is suitable to characterize the system. And uh, here, that is a chaotic time series, actually also um, produced by laser with large delay um, that was very chaotic. It's the Santa Fe task. So this could be a task you feed the system with such a chaotic time series and it's not supposed to tell you whether it's a dog or a cat, but it's supposed to tell you what is the signal um, at time t plus delta t in the future. And that might have some applications for weather prediction or for the stock market, uh, depending on where you want to use uh, the system for. Um, it has been experimentally already realized. We heard this talk also by Miguel Soriano yesterday and then here at the IFISC and by uh, Laurent Langer. It has been implemented and they showed very high speed photonic um, reservoir computing that can recognize million words per second. So actually faster than everyone, anyone can speak. Okay, so Another experimental uh, picture here, I chose the, the paper from Uchida uh, that was published in 2018, just uh, that you get a glimpse about what's going on. You, you put in these Santa Fe tasks, the original signal into one of these integrated laser structures. So you have a fiber where you, um, that you can modulate, so you can input your data. Then you have a distributed feedback laser an amplifier to change the feedback strengths, a passive uh, a phase modulator to change the phase. And then uh, you have a system basically as we talked about uh, a second ago, and you can look how good it is in predicting the reservoir output. And this is what comes out. And then you can calculate the error. And if I talk about the error now, for the rest of my talk, then I will always talk about the normalized root mean square error in RMSE with the root. Uh, it means it is the distance between um, the original signal and the reservoir output uh, squared, then summed and normalized to the variance of the system. Okay, so now we talked a lot about um, 
dynamics and about experiments. So now let's see how we implement uh, this reservoir computing in our model. And for that, what we need is first the data. So we talked already about that, that this is the green, green uh, line here. It's a piecewise constant function of K. So if you have, if you think about the Santa Fe task, then you sample it at certain times and feed that in. And since we only have this one laser, um, we don't have these input weights that we can choose to input into different lasers, but instead um, we modulate the system by a time dependent mask. So uh, that resembles the input weights. So we input basically this uh, time dependent function that has the mask and the data. We inject that into our laser. Then the light goes round in the cavity and uh, does something in response. And that's the last panel here. That's the response of the laser to the input. So due to the mask, it's very uh, changing a lot. And we detect it <clears throat> at these different points in time. And um, that is then the sampled output, which we call S. And this sampled output has as many <clears throat> inputs or as many points here as we choose as virtual nodes. So it's the virtual node number, how often we sample our time series during one input step K. And then um, we can choose a weight vector W out that we multiply by our sampled output and we determine a certain output of our reservoir computer and <clears throat> that is what we need to train. Sorry, <coughs> what's better? Okay, so as I said, rather computing, we don't train the network, we just train the output. And then of course we put in the complete matrix S so it contains all the different uh, input steps K, uh, the virtual nodes are one row and the different K steps are then found in the different um, columns. So what we need to do to train the system is to minimize uh, the distance between the target and the time, uh, the output of the, of the laser. The output of the laser is the output state matrix as multiplied by the out output weights that we need to find and the target is the time series uh, that we chose to predict. And then to solve this minimization problem, that is quite clear how to do that. Gauss and Legendre already did that in 1800. Um, so you can find the minimum, um, the minimum distance, basically a regression task by calculating um, these equation here. So we have the transposed of our state matrix. Then we have this uh, regression parameter lambda uh, to avoid two huge uh, weights and we have the target of our time series down here. So we do a linear regression and we can train our system by matrix inversion. That's the huge advantage. We don't need to do any gradient descent or stuff like that. We just need to do this matrix inversion um, of the matrix where the state matrix and the target comes in. And then of course we can again uh, compute the normalized root mean square error and we have the performance of our system. So that's the um, steps we need to do to decide whether our system is performing or not. So now we have all our uh, stuff together to actually look at the impact of the time scales of our system on the performance. And um, performance can be on the one hand characterized by, by this error, but also by another quantity that we have to look at first, and that's the recallability. Uh, so before we had the task to predict the future, now we have the task to recall the past, which is one minus the error of the target, but the target this time is the input M steps in the past. So here are the inputs. So if I'm at this point here, I want to, I want the laser to recall the last um, input. And um, of course, 
the system had some internal dynamics. So in the beginning, if we plot the recallability as a function of the recall step, at first it can remember nicely the last input, but then at a certain step uh, number it forgets, which is the property of fading memory, and uh, which is a nice thing to characterize um, the performance also of such a system, especially when you need some kind of memory, then you can use <clears throat> this linear memory capacity. And um, to relate that to the dynamics, before we talked about the dynamics of a solitary laser risk feedback. And that is shown here um, in the bottom, we have a pump current and the feedback strengths and the colors now encode the dynamics. It's off here. We have steady state emission, and then we have these complex dynamics. And as we expect, if we look at the computation error, then <clears throat> it's very bad in the regions where um, we have the complex dynamics. But it's also not that good here down uh, for very small feedback strengths where the laser emits steady state but still it has not such a rich um, dynamics, which response yet. It works better if we go to the next uh, stable external cavity mode for higher feedback strengths. And there it seems to perform better. And <coughs> sorry. And uh, looking at the memory capacity, um, we see also here a correlation. So this other way to characterize um, the system where we um, compute how good it can recall past inputs. And there we see also in the regions of complex dynamics, uh, the recallability is very small and um, it increases with increasing feedback strengths. So that has been known for a long time already that if you're at the edge of chaos, so at the edge of chaos would mean here at the edge of this uh, region of um, complex dynamics, then the performance is quite good. We have very dark uh, blue here and the memory capacity also is very high. But with this linear memory capacity, what we looked at is that it depends a lot on the way you choose your time scale. So we have a time scale, the delay tor, and then we have the input um, cycle. So how often you feed in the next input. And at first it was always chosen such that the input time was the same as the delay time, which would be a cut here. And that was the cut where I showed you this uh, fading memory property. But if we change the delay time, so we go up and down um, here on the y-axis, then interesting things happen. So at first, if we shrink the delay, then the recallability decreases, so it can only remember 10 steps in the past. But if we increase the delay, if we make it long, longer and longer, so we feed in multiple inputs per round trip, then we see that the memory capacity, the linear memory capacity becomes holes. So if you make a cut here, um, then we see that it can't remember certain inputs um, while the next one can be remembered very good again, because if they travel around in the cavity, you can think of it like that. The two of them never meet, for instance, um, if you are here at four times the input cycle, and then you can't, or the system, <clears throat> the laser can't remember. Um, to explain, oh yeah, something else um, I want to, what you see here is that there are certain uh, resonance structures popping up at integer ratios between tau and the input cycle t. So they, at this positions, the recallability seems to um, uh, be possible for times longer into the past. But if we look at this computation error, as a function of the input period time, we see that at these integer multiples, the error is much larger and the linear memory capacity drops. So integer multiples between tau and t seems to be a very bad choice for a good um, reservoir computer. And um, 
to understand that, uh, we did some work together with Sergey Anchuk and Florian Stelzer, the mathematics department at the TU, and uh, we tried to find out what the topology of this delay system um, is if we want to look at it um, as a map that has an underlying um, network. So if we rewrite the delay system um, by an equivalent dynamical map, as, as has been done here, um, the node distance is important. So just as a, a reminder, that was the distance between these virtual nodes of our mask. And then we get a complex uh, formula. I don't want to go into detail into that. I just plot this matrix R. So I have a map that gives me the position of my dynamic system one step um, ahead. And this map looks like a ring structure if I plot this um, adjacency matrix here. And um, every dark blob means I have a connection between these uh, different nodes. And um, what we see if I go to twice the input, um, uh, if twice the delay time is the input circle, then these rows here split up and I get a higher connectivity. So the topology of this underlying uh, connectivity between different inputs is more complex um, for non-integer multiples. And that is one um, possibility to explain why um, the performance is better off resonance because we have just a more complex uh, topology. Um, just who's interested, those are the matrices, but I don't want to go into detail here. Um, I want to focus on, in, on the time scale of these uh, virtual node distance, again, this theta, um, because we already learned something about tor and t, how they impact um, the dynamics. But now for, um, actually implementing the system, we also have to chain, uh, choose this uh, node distance. And there already previous populations showed that there's an optimal way to choose um, this value. And we looked at two different lasers. So in the laser community, they are um, determined by class A and class B lasers. So a class B laser, um, the important thing is the time scale gamma here, which is the ratio between electron and photon lifetime. Um, if the electrons live much longer than the photons, then the laser uh, oscillates, while in the other case, it, it's just decaying um, with an exponential function. And we compared these two lasers um, as a function of this node distance. So uh, here's the node distance. It changes over two orders of magnitude. This is the error of our computing system. And now we have different class A lasers here. They seem to have an optimum um, where the node distance is a bit smaller than this um, half decay, uh, the time where the intensity is decayed to its half. So this is the T one half, it's shown here where you decayed to half the value. Um, while in a class B laser, since we have two times here, we have the period of the oscillations and we have the decay. And there in this class B laser, they seem to perform better when the real and the imaginary part of the uh, Jacobian, the eigenvalue of the Jacobian are on a similar um, order of magnitude. While when they are very different, it seems to perform um, worse. And the interesting thing, again, when we go off resonant, so before this part was for the resonant case, if you go off resonant, um, then the error becomes much smaller. We can increase that by a factor of four more or less. And there the class B laser um, with a node distance about 40 seems to perform nicely. So um, if we sum that up, it seems that the optimal performance for class A laser is found for a third of this decay time. While a class B laser, um, we have to choose the tether such that it matches the real and the imaginary part of the dynamic eigenvalue. So if we choose all these parameters right, 
the, the nice node distance that gives us uh, the best um, error possible, then we can do such a two-dimensional scan of the clock cycle and the delay time tor. And we see the resonances again. We've seen them before. These are the lines where we have integer multiples here. And what we see is that at these lines, the error changes much more than we can explain by the node distance or um, different property. So um, we wanted to find a more analytic explanation for the resonances. So we have this first um, explanation or the first um, argument that the topology is more complex for off-resonant good uh, chosen values for tor and t, but um, we wanted to look at the non at the um, small signal properties of the laser. So again, here the, the signal is injected into the laser. We have the feedback, and now we want to look at the dynamic eigenvalues of the laser and see if we can explain these resonances um, with that. So we introduce a new new quantity, which is the average angular distance. So what does that mean? We think about uh, the input again. So U1, U2, and uh, U1 are the different inputs at different uh, steps in time. And we um, plot here the intensity and the carry invasion, uh, inversion, which is our phase space. If we don't input any data, we are at the equilibrium here. So this would be our external cavity mode. Um, our equilibrium where our laser sits without input. Then the input, a small perturbation, the laser is here. And before it decays to the equilibrium, we input the next other um, input, U2. And in phase space, we have a rotation of phi k. This is our angular um, average distance, which is the imaginary part of the eigenvalue of the Jacobian that I talked about at the beginning, um, times the input clock cycle, because that's the time it had to rotate here. And then since we have infinitely many eigendirections and eigenvalues, because we have a delay system, so it's not as easy that we just have these three um, dynamic quantities, but we have the delay, so we have infinitely many. But if you calculate this quantity, the average angular distance that's done here, and then plotted modulo two pi. So it goes from zero um, to two pi. And this is what we get in the plane of tor and input cycle t. And you see lines where this average angular distance is close to zero or close to two pi. So we took these dark regions and plotted them off on top of our numerics um, in green. So the numerics show the linear memory capacity. And we see that agrees very well with this uh, quantity of the um, average angular distance. So the imaginary part of our eigenvalue plays a huge role here uh, in understanding the resonances that we found between tor and t for small inputs. So all this analysis is for small um, inputs. And then, of course, we not only have the imaginary part, but also um, the real part of the eigenvalue. And um, again, we have this picture here. So we rotate in phase space. But since it's the real part, it reduces the length of this vector here, this delta S1 and delta S2. So if we take the ratio of both, we introduce the quantity lambda, the average distance ratio. Um, and um, if this is close to one, that means the ratio doesn't uh, doesn't uh, the ratio is one, so the distance doesn't change much, uh, which means the real part is close to zero. So we have a critical eigenvalue, and the dynamics is very small, uh, very slow. While when we have a small lambda, the information decays fast, and the system nearly goes back to the equilibrium, which we don't want because then it cancels all the information that has been sent into the system. If it reaches its steady state, then the information is gone. So we don't uh, want that. And if we um, plot this average distance ratio 
again in the space of the feedback strings in the pump current uh, as a color code and bright means a large lambda so close to one which means we have critical eigenvalues with real part close to zero then we see these are the regions where also the linear memory capacity um, is very large so where the system can remember a lot of the past inputs because it just forgets slower and um, these are the regions where we choose to operate the laser these are our optimized values and um, if we plot then the performance in the memory or two quantities now over the number of virtual nodes which is our readout dimension and of course should increase the performance then we see for the optimized values let's just concentrate on the red curve here for certain um, virtual nodes uh, links we can um, improve the performance by putting in more and more virtual nodes um, if we have, have this other point here that is not optimized where the system forgets very fast then more and more virtual nodes uh, don't help uh, to improve the dynamics so this is the first uh, that we can learn from the um, linear um, analysis of our uh, delay system. So we shouldn't uh, have a dynamic that is too fast and forgets very fast. And um, we shouldn't input uh, the next input on top of the one that we had before, which is then the distance reduction, which are these resonances that I talked about. So now I have to look at the watch. I just have 10 minutes left. So um, I think I will shortly just talk about, um, I will skip the laser network networks for a second, sorry for that, but um, I will just at the last point talk about this um, deep, reservoir computing um, where um, we again collaborated with Sergei Janschuk and that was a master student, Mirko Goldman, who did uh, this work. And here was the idea to not just take a single delay system, but take uh, ensemble of different delay systems that are coupled uh, sequentially. So this one inputs into the next one and so on. And um, what we found was that we can improve the performance a lot by um, putting these um, different delay systems behind um, each other. So this is a graphic showing it. We have the performance again on the y-axis and the reservoir size on the x-axis. And um, one means just the single delay system and five is we have five of these lasers. And uh, you can see that we can uh, largely improve uh, the performance, which you can also see in this graph here, um, where the error is plotted in this gray gray uh, uh, curve beneath. So this is the performance error, which is decreased a lot if you compare that to the single um, delay system. And um, one reason why we can do that is also uh, related to the um, internal dynamics and that you can uh, use different properties of these different delay systems one after um, the other. And um, what I want to show you is this linear memory capacity here, because in the beginning I showed you we have these um, holes in the memory that certain inputs cannot be remembered um, if we change um, the delay length. But if we then put a second system behind. So we have here a two layer system that has the holes at different positions um, that we can fill the, so we can fill the holes in the memory by just sub uh, sequentially um, adding different systems with different delay lines. And that um, increases our linear memory. Um, so you have this one layer system here, which has a linear memory capacity of 15. And if we, put the second um, system behind, then we can increase that a lot. And then we can also start to play around with these um, memory capacities, um, which was done here, which I think is very neat. If we have um, just one 
system with delay and we look at the different contributions not only of the linear memory capacity that I introduced today, but we can also define different tasks where you have to um, recall the product of different steps in the task, which would be the quadratic memory and cubic, which would be a polynomial of order three of some inputs into the past. And for this um, first layer, the linear memory um, isn't increasing with the number of nodes and we get more and more quadratic contributions. But if we um, choose our deep reservoir here with uh, sequentially decreasing delay lines, um, then we can increase this linear memory a lot because of this augmentation that you just saw. So if I then have a task that needs a lot of this linear memory, um, I can increase that a lot. But if I have a task that needs cubic memory, for instance, then I can adjust the delay length in a different manner. And I can tune the system such that I have this uh, cubic memory and I can um, optimize a task that needs this property. Okay. So, sorry, I didn't manage to talk about the laser networks, but still I want to summarize um, what I hope I convinced you about is that the time scales of the internal dynamics matter when we think about machine learning with um, dynamic reservoirs. So if you use a physical reservoir, we have the advantage that we don't need to train it, but we have the disadvantage that we need to understand it first. So we have to look at the eigenvalues of the Jacobium, that is one possibility, or we have to characterize the small signal response or something. So if we know those time scales, then we can optimize um, our performance. And um, with this deep reservoir computing, um, this is a setup that can be nicely used to tune uh, this information processing capability. Okay, and with that, I want to thank you for listening. And if there are questions, just go ahead and ask. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Cathy. So uh, let's see if there is any question. I see that uh, some uh, question has answer change. So open, I see two questions open. Uh, one from Stenio. I thanks very much for the interesting presentation. Would like to know how much can you trust in the Jacobian transformation for the analysis when you are working close to the bifurcation? That's the first question. Then there is a second question. Another question about the holes in the memory. Uh, do you think this is because we might not have a current a correct readout layer? It is possible that the information is there, but we cannot recover with the pseudo inverse. Okay, yeah, I think you're very good questions. Uh, let's start with the first one. Um, of course, if we are very close to the bifurcation, uh, nonlinear contributions might play a role. But uh, so far what we did, if um, we have a small inputs and our analysis here was usually a, a percent of the driving pump current was the input. And for these operations, um, the Jacobian um, the results, so the eigenvalues, they came very close to the actual performance of the system. So we tested that numerically. And um, the other question with the readout layer, um, I don't really understand. I mean, what our readout layer is just the intensity that we get of our system. And if there is more information encoded into the, in the face of our laser, then of course we could gain even more information by reading out also the face. But I think by, if you choose the intensity and you optimize uh, your laser for this readout layer that you had chosen, um, then it's not related to the pseudo, uh, it's the pseudo inverse. I think that is not the problem. The problem is that you might not uh, take everything out that the system can give you. So if you need the face or even more information, but this pseudo inverse usually doesn't make a problem as long as you have enough, uh, a, a huge state matrix that you use to train your system. <clears throat> Okay. 
So the it looks like uh, Stadio is happy of the answer. So uh, I don't know if there is. I don't see any other uh, question for the moment. I have a question. May I ask? Okay, please go ahead. Yes. Now I was curious. So you show that most of the performance is related to time series analysis. But I was wondering if you tried other other benchmark, other data sets, say something related to speech recognition or other time series. So I think for that. Well, no, the other thing we tried was just this uh, nonlinear memory capacity or this information processing uh, capacity, which is of course, also based on, on time series that you put in. I mean, you can use the system also for, for speech recognition when you put in the spectra somehow uh, time yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, multiplex, but we didn't do that with our systems. Um, but what we want to do next is in this memory capacity, in the total memory capacity, basically all the properties of the system are included. So if you calculate this, um, processing capability and all these different higher order nonlinear memory capacities. Um, then somehow all the different tasks are included. You just need to find out which part of the memory capacity you need for certain tasks. Mm -hmm. So this is what we need to do in the, in the future that we can relate this uh, more general quantity of the memory capacities, the nonlinear memory capacities with certain tasks, which are always a specialized choice, of course. You, you cannot optimize the system for all the different. So, and I have a, another question. So one general argument is that photonic networks are more energetically efficient, you know, as you, as you stated at the beginning. Uh, do you have an idea for lasers if this is still true or, or not? Because I, I have the impression that lasers are, consume a lot of energy. They, uh, I'm not sure that they are so efficient with respect to electronics or, or, or not. Did you check this? Well, that depends on the laser that you use. Um, the normal quantum well lasers are already energy efficient, but you can get better by using some quantum dots that have even lower threshold current. Of course, that is the, the energy you have to put in. The, the, there has to be some light coming out. But then you have also the micropillar lasers where you have an even smaller gain medium. So you need even less uh, energy to, to invert them and to get the light out. Okay. So I think they are still more energy of energy efficiency than these electronic um, neural networks because you just need this one device. You, you don't have to have these huge networks that yeah. all need to need to be operated. Okay. Thank you. I have a very general question as well, which is probably related to what also Claudio asked and what you said before. So what is actually the ultimate limit in terms of latency or speed? of the system is dictated by the optical components or by the electronic that you use, uh, for example, to encode the system, uh, the lens of the card, external feedback or whatever. What is your perception about that? Well, so far, all the realizations are limited by the by the back end because you somehow need to do the electronic conversion, right? Because you, if you detect, you have the signal electronically and that slows you down. But um, in principle, this can also be realized optically. So then what, what slows, slows us down here is the delay line. So you have to feed in the data se sequentially. I mean, you can tune a, a bit. You, you see, we can change, uh, change the ratio between T and tau, but still this tau uh, can't be very short. And if it's too short, that's then the limit of our time scale. So how fast we can get, but still it's on, what is it, nanoseconds, right? Or that we can get here. If we, uh, another limit is of course the internal dynamics of the laser. So if the laser itself is faster, so if you have some process, some coherent process, if you use the polarization inside the laser somehow, um, that uh, relaxes on a much faster time scale, and then you could become even faster, right? So these two things are your limits. First, the internal dynamics of the laser, and then the, the delay line, because you have to feed in sequentially. Thank you so much. So let's see if there is any other uh, questions. Uh, there is actually a question from uh, Pavel. Could you please tell whether you investigated the computational ability of this system with respect to the same parameters? 
if yes, uh, there are then are there the same problems with the resonances? Um, yes. If I, if I understand the question, yeah, the, the question is a bit. Uh, I think you can find on the on the chat itself. Yeah, but, but I, I think he he means that I only showed these resonances for the com for the performance, but they also occur in this memory capacity and in this other uh, task that we. Uh, what, what is meant with the same parameters? Maybe the, the Pavel Dimitri could help me. Pavel, I don't um, know if you are listening and you can, you can even speak, I think, or put another note uh, on the chat. Okay. Because, of course, for the different, uh, we, we had different lasers. So we had the, this class I and the class B laser, we had the Stuart Lander and the Mackie Glass system. So we always had different parameters of the system itself. But the resonances, they always occur because that's a very deep property of these delay systems. So as soon as you have the delay, you will have the resonances that doesn't depend uh, on the system that you chose. Oh, something happens here. So there's another question. Oops. Uh, yeah, there is a, okay. I'm talking about the computational ability dependence with respect to Tau. That was the comment of Pavel. And then there is another question by Tiger Gianuzzi. Thanks for the speech. I would like to ask if when you extend to a large number of virtual nodes layer is equal to put in a cascade more virtual nodes layer or in parallel. Uh, um, well, he, I think he's referring to this deep reservoir computing where we had we we didn't extend that to a larger number i think that was here in the picture that i showed we had about five layers i mean that could be extended of course the problem is that for every layer that you add we had to adjust the parameters of the system a bit to um, stay away from uh, bifurcations and dynamics. So with every layer you add with a different delay tor, you have to um, be careful that you chose the parameter correctly. So in this picture that I showed here, let me show that again. Um, what the student did was that for every um, arrangement of different layers, he did an extensive parameter search to find the optimal point um, of performance so that there aren't any bifurcations in the way, because that's always the problem with the delay systems and the multi-stability that uh, your dynamics can screw you up. So you have to optimize um, that point. So if you go to much more layers, then uh, you're approaching the point where you don't want to be because you don't want to do this training that this deep uh, the, the deep learning systems do, right? So that's why we choose only a small number. Excellent, thank you very much, Kate. And um, I don't uh, see any more questions. So I think uh, I will uh, move on to say thanks uh, for the great talk. Actually, we had uh, three very nice talk in my session and, uh, and uh, I think we're going to meet uh, tomorrow, unless uh, uh, Stefano has, in the panel has something to say. No. Okay. okay. So and see you tomorrow. Nice evening and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> bye. 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 bye.